Um, I have Mike Tattersfield, who's president and CEO of Krispy Kreme Donuts. This is an 83 year old donut brand uh, based in Charlotte, North Carolina, that in July became a public company again, after being owned for about five years by JAB Holding Company. And uh, we've been looking back at 2020 for the series. And even during the pandemic year of 2020, Krispy Kreme hit record sales, I believe, of 1.1 billion. Though they did report a loss, as many companies did. But it sounds like things are, are, are going great this year. So, Mike, I want to ask you to kind of walk us through the transformation that Krispy Kreme has been going through. And this started under JAB. Uh, moving away from that sort of um, from the from the wholesale donut to a fresher product and really transforming to an omni-channel strategy for the entire company. So can you kind of give us an overview of where Krispy Kreme is right now? I mean, uh, you know, six years ago, I came in. I'm a, you know, I helped lead the acquisition even with JB when I was running a Caribou Coffee at the time. And it was really about the opportunity I saw in the sweet treat space, right? So it's a, how do you make sure that we maintain this uh, amazing brand called Krispy Kreme and keep it really focused on doing donuts exceptionally well. So it was about taking control of the operations where we should, right? So then we can, it's not about building donut shops everywhere. It's about leveraging and building an omni-channel model. We have a 381 hot light shops around the world. I'm um, making sure that we can make, a, you know, drive that consistency and then do fresh donuts um, uh, through an omni-channel model which was already happening in the UK and Australia. So we love that aspect of it. And part of this transformation over the past six years was bringing that into the fold, not to just say, hey, we don't wanna believe in building partnerships or franchise business, but so that we could actually have those um, uh, businesses that can actually leverage, we can leverage them to start to build out the franchise system as we build international. And the big difference today versus in our past is we truly are a global business, right? So there's a significant part of our business is international today. So when I talk about those 10,000 points of access, half of them are in the international business, right? So they're delivering fresh donuts um, uh, in that aspect to the marketplace and then making sure that then from every day forward, whenever we open up a new country or continue to transform the U.S., to this omni-channel model, it is thought through from a, how do we build a hub and then add spokes to it. And the spokes can be a fresh shop, they can be a, a grocer cabinet, they can be a dark shop, you know, so you really are leveraging uh, the donut factories, which is very different than the way we used to run a model in the past. Focus is on donuts. We love doing that more than 90%, you know, what we sell is donuts. In fact, uh, you know, we continue to do that every day. So explain the difference between the, the hot light theater shops and the donut factories, which are the serving as the hubs in your hub and smoke model. So think about them. The majority of our hot light shops are those factories, right? So that's what they are, right? They're producing shops, but they're experiential. We might have, a, on top of that, we have another 25 donut factories that help us in the urban locations because they're facilitating making sure that we can reach to the points of access. But the majority of what we do are from our hot light shops is we build those and then we leverage them to make sure that we get to the point of access. And we've learned from cities in London, you know, with five hubs, we get to 600 points of access, right? So really important that we figure that out. And it's a fresh donut every single time. And so the points of access are places like I know in my, I, I live in Southern California, we have Ralph's grocery stores, which is a Kroger. They have now Krispy Kreme little stands that have fresh donuts, which is amazing. That's what so, you need, right? points of access. Right. In, in the past, right, they might have been there in the past with a franchisee, but those donuts were potentially three to five days old. Wasn't a good donut experience, right? Right now, they're done fresh every single day. There's routes. Um, uh, they leverage the, the hot light experience. And the hot light still stays special, right? Because we don't build hot light shops everywhere, right? So when people still want to do a unique merchant experience, they can come visit a hot light shop. There's a lot of things we can do in those shops. And then we leverage whether it's product or something through the points of access. But the experiential part is still happening inside of our donut shops. And so you, you're, you're talking about growing those points of access. Tell us how you're doing that. So when we currently today, we use a, so we have hubs, the majority, you know, where there's donut shops today, we either build out the back of it so we can get a routing um, uh, ability to make sure that we can deliver fresh donuts. So we add that capacity. 
And then we figure out where are the right customers that we want to serve to along a certain geography or time. Um, um, and we end up focusing on building roughly 800 to 1,000 points of access on a yearly basis across the globe. Half of those tend to be in the United States, half of those tend to be in the international markets. So that's the discipline. Now, when a, let's say we open up a new country like we did in Egypt, right? They will start figuring out how to do the hub and spoke model. So instead of just opening up donut shops all over Cairo, right? There'll be a very disciplined approach about building more production capability to then really leverage that into the points of access. So building the route system so that you can get fresh donuts there. That is now done very differently than in the past. It's now building basically a donut company and making sure that we leverage the production capability in every single country we work, whether it's franchise owned or run by us. Well, and, and since you mentioned that, um, it, 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 since 2018, I think Krispy Kreme has been acquiring some franchisees. I think it's 165 in the US basically since that time. Uh, and uh, in some cases, keeping the franchisee as a stakeholder so that they can operate the shops. But tell us what that strategy is all about. And is Krispy Kreme moving away from franchising? So in the, in the U.S., we're a little north of about 85% um, uh, where we're company owned. We do have franchise partners that are there. Um, uh, some do the, that are working with us. We're not looking to continue to build out franchise partners in the U.S. We have the operating capacity to do that in the United States. And we have picked some partners with us that are actually building out the omni-channel model in California and the western parts of the U.S. where very, very skilled operators are building that with us. As we move across the world, um, uh, we've made key investments in uh, six countries, right? The UK and Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, and Japan. That's where we're gonna start really leveraging that operating capacity so that they can help the partnerships or adjacent countries, which will be run by franchisees or operating partners, right? That will do that on their own, and but they will run it as an omni-channel model. Right? So they won't be just doing donut shops, they will be doing the whole omni-channel, including routes, including getting into that. In fact, we just, um, we've seen a lot of work happen. And in South Africa, for example, last year, past year and a half, they used to just be a donut shop business. You know, now they have 200 doors. Their growth in South Africa in the middle of the pandemic has been fantastic. That just gives you an example of how they see the opportunity of reaching customers beyond the hot light experience, but still leveraging it. You're saying doors, and that's your lingo for a point of access or for yes. you know, Get, getting into a grocery door, a convenience right. store, right? So it's just the point of access inside of it. Right, right. Okay. Okay. And so how does e-commerce fit into this, um, which I think in Q2 it was uh, nearly 20% of sales? So it was uh, in Q2. So right now it's about 17% on a global level, right? So, you know, it's steady now that you've seen that you can imagine in 2020, uh, we just launched delivery and e-commerce. We were very fortunate, right? So it happened to hit on, we launched it February 29th, right? So hit at the right time um, uh, and then have maintained it. So it continues to build, right? As we see the opportunity that one day we see that e-commerce um, uh, should be about 25% of the total, you know, out of the retail system. We see that happening. That's already happening in some of our key countries around the world. So this isn't just, um, we see the potential, then it's about how we develop that and then balancing that with these points of access because sometimes a point of access might be a fresh shop, right? Where we're actually delivering from the hot shop to the fresh shop, but that unlocks the delivery capacity in that area. So when you say e-commerce, that includes delivery. That's correct. Yeah, that's digital orders for- Digital for e-commerce gifting. Um, uh, we see that part, which is, um, pretty unique to us in the past, you know, you had the business was focused on um, potentially serving coffee or non donut um, uh, business. We actually love donuts. I yeah. mean, that's what we do. I call it freaking awesome donuts do that incredibly well. If we can do that exceptionally well, and the majority of times we're selling sometimes 90% of our business is donuts actually 93%. That's what we do. Uh, if we can continue that focus on doing that exceptionally well, we'll continue then building that business out because that's getting to points of access that drives efficiency that drives the freshness that drives all the connection and the reach and the potential of the market when we start to figure out selling coffee or those things they're a very complementary part to a fresh shop business but not to a donut hub 
right? A donut hub is really about manufacturing, making sure the donuts get there. Okay, so now explain about the branded sweet treat line. This is taking it a step further. So, so if you think about the fresh business is only limited by the amount of hubs and routes that you wanna build. And we're not gonna be in every single grocer from a fresh line business, right? We will be very disciplined to make sure that scarcity and freshness is still top of line. Americans, for example, they eat their majority of their donuts um, uh, a lot through the grocery stores, right? You know, whether it's convenience or through grocery. And that's a pretty big business, right? So we've started to, you know, our customers said that we could evolve into that. So we created donut inspired um, uh, product lines that start to go in there. We've done this about, it's about a startup business that we're a little, little over a year. Um, uh, we continue to be with 10 SKUs, each individual SKU is in the top quartile of Walmart, right? So now you can see that it, it's really starting to resonate in there. We're growing at the, we're disciplined on the velocity, right? So we're seeing the velocity get to 16% and growing as we start to really think through how do you double the size? Um, uh, we grew about 3000 doors, you know, between the second quarter and the third quarter as we start to evolve. But it's really then about, and we grew 33% just to, you know, in volume from the third quarter to the second, but it's still a startup business. Um, uh, we treat this in a very thoughtful way. We see the consumer really dictating how far we want to grow, but the majority of time is really about how we drive our fresh business across the globe, doing that exceptionally well, and we'll explore um, uh, opportunities like branded sweet treat line when it when it's available. And and of course, you also have insomnia cookies. So tell us a little bit about what your plans are for that brand. Well, they're an amazing brand, right? So think about that. It's a brand that lives through colleges a lot that then evolved into the urban marketplace. If you have children, they'll tell you all about it, right? Yep. You're probably hitting the guest pass for mom and dad and sending the tickets to them. But I think it's- uh, Yeah, that's my sons that have been ordering that. My sons, not me. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens, but I, I think it's always, they're at 206 shops, they're growing, they have a really clear connection, they, they grew, imagine through gifting and e-commerce, even last year, they grew, right, so they were starting to really show the power of, uh, they learned a lot from Krispy Kreme, we learn a lot from them on digital and what they do, they're late night, 50% of their business is delivery slash e-commerce, uh, they see that opportunity continue to grow, uh, they will con they have a lot of runway to grow in the United States, uh, first off, and then we'll continue to see what opportunities might exist out there. But a lot in front of them, brand really has great traction. And is that a franchise brand as well? So is that something that's that growing? Is all, that is all company owned. So that's one, oh, one, yeah. one owner. Um, uh, the great thing about that is that cultures are very similar and the founder stayed with us. He's got a big stake in the business still and he loves what he does every day. And so he's very focused on building out the Insomnia brand. Okay, can you give us any hints about what might be we can expect to see in 2022 for Krispy Kreme? I think you'll see, you know, us continue to build out, you know, our hub and spoke model. There's a lot of geography in the United States. In fact, out of the 10 largest markets in the urban markets in the United States, we're only in one of them. You know, from a develop, you know, so the opportunity of transforming and leveraging the existing business. Now we weren't. I, I, let me let me rephrase that. We we actually might have had a donut shop, one, right? But we weren't building the route system, right? So now it's really about um, expanding our donut line capability, doing it in a very capital efficient way, and getting access in the urban markets. That'll be a one key priority. But that partnership and that power that we see in the international business is incredible, right? Because what you see is the gifting and occasion part of the business. People like to celebrate. <laughs> People want to celebrate birthdays, holidays, gifting. And a dozen's business really works around the, the world because of sharing and the, the gathering. When it's still an affordable price point, when you think about dozens, right? So you, you can think about, you can be very thoughtful on how you manage pricing, even in a high commodity or inflationary environment. And then making sure that partners that understand the omni-channel model do that from day one. So you'll start to see the international business start to develop a lot via partnerships um, um, in a lot of countries that we're not. We're only in 31 countries. There's a lot of growth to still do the 31 countries that we're in, but there's clear opportunities in whether it's Western Europe, 
um, uh, Brazil, China, others of the world, but we're looking you know, to make sure that we have the right partners and we'll build this out appropriately while leveraging um, uh, our existing business. Okay, I know my sons were definitely, when they were young, they used to ask for Krispy Kreme donuts for instead of birthday cake for their birthdays, which could say, it. please take it as a compliment to your brand, but it also says something about my ability as a baker. But we enjoyed <laughs> Krispy Kreme on birthdays. That was our tradition. Yeah, I, so, I, I, think, I think you'll see, because you asked me a lot of really interesting things. I think you'll see the hot light starting to take a big presence where the hot light means something around the world. There's those unique attributes to what Krispy Kreme is so powerfully known for. When you can leverage those 381 hot light shops, you'll build a few more hubs. We only will build around 15 hubs on a yearly basis. So that's not a significant amount. But what's significant is the point of access that those 15 hubs will start doing, right? They'll start to drive the route. They'll start to get to the customers. But when those you leverage the hot light, you leverage glazing, you leverage glazing, you can do, let's say you can have a chocolate and uh, our original glaze going at the same time in the same shop, right? So you can see that theatrical approach. Uh, we're starting to get into some really interesting areas such as um, hand cut and rolled. So you can start to see how you can premiumize the brand um, uh, in a really interesting way where it's gotta be exceptional. Right, because people will expect. I'm um, happy to take premium, but it's got to it's got to match up to that. I see that evolution continue to happen in the brand. So it used to be that the light would turn on when when donuts are being glazed, but it sounds like with the kind of volume you're expecting to do, the, the, the light's going to be on all the time. I would imagine it, it, it's it's moving, but you, we do have cake lines. We do do other things, right? So it's really it's really educating about how and what it means. I know Americans are much more used to the hot light. Right. And as the world's used to the world was fresh, Americans were used to the hot light. Right. So now we're trying to make sure that we can do the hot light experience and have a fresh donut experience anywhere in the world and then leverage the iconic pieces of the brand that have been in there. This is an 84 year old brand, super powerful, um, uh, you know, and then it's how we continue to evolve around the world with the right partnerships and making sure we're extremely disciplined of doing that well. OK. Okay, Mike, I know I need to let you go. Thank you so much for being here and sharing some of the strategy ahead. I look forward to hearing what's gonna happen with earnings today, so. No, I really appreciate it. And I always take a little bit of time to say thank you to all the Krispy Kremers that just do an amazing job every single day, making sure Krispy Kreme um, uh, delivers joy around the world. So thank you for taking a little bit of time to chat with me.